Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be in Florence and in Italy, actually, it's my first time ever. Uh, so I've been very, very much welcomed by uh, all your hospitality. And uh, today's talk, I kind of want to come to you guys with three things. Well, first of all, I want to make it fun. Uh, second of all, I want you guys to be inspired uh, by doing open source and contributing to open source. And finally, I want to tell you about the importance of securing your application and specifically talk about the aspect of authorization, so making sure that access control is secured within your app. Uh, there we go, a lot of animations. So why would we contribute to open source? Well, open source actually is uh, something that sometimes is looked upon. Uh, not many realize the power that we can bring with open source. And there is a, there is a few things that, uh, if I can just, Okay, I'm, I'm missing my notes. Okay, let's, let's rock without the notes. So open source, it, uh, it fosters innovation. Uh, it definitely encourages collaboration. So it allows you to meet new people. It allows you to look at different, uh, different um, parts of, of, uh, of open source to learn more code. Um, it offers transparency. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry. Let me just uh, let me just fix this. I don't, I'm not have no idea what's going on. All right, I think we're good now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. Uh, I, th I think it's fine. If I just, I think we're good. Okay. Um, no, it's fine. I think it's all working now. So it's all, yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay, we're good to go. Um, so what else can uh, open source do to you? Well, it, it can accelerate uh, how you learn to code. It can introduce you to other aspects of code that you maybe never heard of, meet people that maybe can inspire you to do something else. And uh, what's the greatest thing about open source? Well, it's knowing that your solution can actually help others and, you know, like I said, accelerate the problem solving. So is open source worth it? Is it worth it for us to contribute? Is it worth it for us to dedicate our precious developer time to make sure that we can actually offer something that's valuable? Well, I have a little uh, story time for you. Uh, and this is regarding my story and what I have done. So uh, I used to work as a lead uh, front-end developer uh, at Cisco in Silicon Valley. And uh, I used to be an intern there, so I, uh, I wanted to go out to as many hackathons as I can and meet as many people and introduce myself to code. And I actually attended one hackathon. It was in San Francisco at the uh, uh, GitHub headquarters. And the uh, idea of the hackathon was to innovate something that uh, would bring people together, right? So uh, essentially what I did is uh, I came with my few friends and we decided to uh, build something that was missing in the market. At that point, Spotify was huge. It uh, you know, really was appealing to a lot of audiences because people love listening to music and they love uh, essentially using that for the web browser because it's easy. But Apple at that point didn't have a feature like that. Um, they were lacking an open music player in the browser. So we decided let's use that opportunity and let's create one before Apple does. Uh, so we did. And long story short, we actually won the hackathon, we launched the project, and we started gaining recognition. It appealed to a large audience. Now, one important thing I need to mention here is that that project was open sourced. Uh, firstly, because we didn't want to get sued by Apple, uh, because we were creating something that obviously was their target. Um, but secondly, because we wanted people to help maintain it. Uh, if there were a lot of eyes on it, obviously there will be a lot of contributions, and people would benefit from just using it. So we launched it, and a week later, uh, we ended up getting almost 20,000 individual users from 141 different countries in the world. Now, the word started to spread with, us, uh, with any uh, you know, popular open source project, and we ended up being number one trending on GitHub in the JavaScript. Uh, things got even better than that, because we were number two trending in the whole of GitHub for what we've built. Now, we weren't aware that this is going to happen. Uh, it was something that was totally unexpected. You know, we're just four guys trying to build something that's cool, and suddenly it goes viral. By the fifth month, uh, we reached 181,000 users from 180 countries. Now, 
it's safe to say that there is 193 countries in the United Nations. So it was a pretty big achievement for us. Um, but we were quite sneaky with what we did. We wanted to make sure that our open source project is reaching at the right audience. That's why we knew these analytics. And uh, we ended up actually seeing on the analytics that people are using this app internally from Apple. And we were like, well, okay. Um, you know, how many Apple users are, you know, in, internal Apple um, workers are actually using it? First it was two, then it was 10, then it was 20. Uh, a few months later, it was 120 people from Apple internally. And what happened next? Well, this is us. Uh, we actually got reached out by Apple. They invited us to the main headquarters for lunch to find out about what we did. And obviously, there was a lot of questions, and they asked us, uh, you know, information that probably they found valuable. And uh, of course, with that being said, um, we ended up, uh, because of that achievement, uh, you know, reaching thousands of stars on GitHub, and we were recognized as uh, top 100 people shaping British uh, technology by the business, business Insider. So the question is, is it worth it? Well, any open source project, well, absolutely. You never know what's going to happen with it. You're going to help other developers. You're going to help other people who are actually uh, wanting to use it for a specific purpose. And you never know how much impact your project may have. Now, this wasn't 100% code related because obviously it maybe, well, maybe it helped developers listen to better music and co provide better code. Um, but of course, you know, it, it still serves as a, as a great example of what open source can do and how far it can lead you. So now let's talk a little bit about access control. And my question here is, and raise your hands if you do, who knows the difference between authentication and authorization? Okay, so we've got a, a lot of hands going up. That's good, that's good. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, those two words are super similar. Uh, and a lot of people get them confused. Now, access control is hard in general. It's very hard to manage permissions. And even though it might seem like it's an easy thing to do at the very beginning, well, actually, it proves to be very, very difficult as the company grows, as the company scales, um, and as you have to start investing engineering time into actually producing your own solution. And there is a few reasons why it's difficult. There is now, we moved from monolith to uh, microservice architecture, and it's very, very hard to manage those permissions. Um, so there's a lot of many cases that need to be covered. So you've got a lot of use cases where something needs to be protected, some, there is some sensitive data, and of course, those use cases keep changing, uh, and you have to keep adapting to that. So you have to constantly, constantly be improving your authorization service. The other thing is that when the company grows, there is different departments, and they might have different requirements, and you really have to adjust to that. So your permissions start to become much more granular. Maybe you have to have permissions that are not just based on a simple role that, for example, administrator can do X on a file, but you might have restrictions where geolocation comes into place. So administrator that is located in continental US and suddenly he only works for the engineering department can only edit a file between 9 and 5 p.m. because that's what maybe the product manager wants, right? Um, so obviously they become much more complex. Now the other thing, and I think a very important part, is that if you make a bug, if you have a test that's written wrong, that doesn't, that succeeds but it shouldn't, uh, it can have devastating effects on your whole application. It can really, really break things and you can get in a lot of trouble. That's why usually when there is a solution out there that helps you build it, uh, you should use it. All right, so I want to talk you through understanding a very typical use case uh, of what actually permissions look like. So, Usually most of you might understand permissions when you have to firstly introduce them into the system as administrator and not administrator. The administrator has permissions to do everything and everyone else just doesn't or they have very restricted permissions to do so. Then your company grows, your app scales, and suddenly you need to introduce a super admin. Now you have three roles, a super admin, an admin, and a viewer. And you elevate those permissions, you write new rules that have to serve uh, and, and essentially restrict the, the, the access to the app. But then your application grows even more. And what do you do then? Well, then you have a developer at a company that wakes up on Monday morning, and he just already knows that he has a big week ahead of him. Uh, he gets to his job, he opens up his laptop, and he's, he's a ticket. And it's uh, implement 15 roles, uh, new 15 roles with very granular permissions, and make sure that they're based on many granular attributes 
uh, and just add them into the system, test them, and do everything that you're supposed to. Well, you can probably understand that the developer is trying to pull his hair out at this moment. He's like, why have I signed up to this? Uh, and then he does it. He writes the test, he creates a PR, he gets a merge conflict, uh, then his CTO shouts at him because uh, he didn't write any tests, uh, so then he has to go back and do everything, and then he publishes it, and something is also wrong, someone gets access to sensitive information, he gets fired, and that's how permissions can end. And we definitely don't want that, so we want to find a better solution uh, to do that. And uh, that's the developer that got the Jira ticket in the morning. <laughs> um, all right. So how can we prevent all of this crazy, uh, unfortunate events from happening when it comes to restricting permissions? Well, OPA comes to the rescue. Who knows OPA? Who's worked with OPA? It's an open policy uh, uh, agent. It's a project that was adopted by the CNCF, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, as a standard uh, for implementing and writing uh, permissions and writing rules for those permissions. Now, OPA is an all-purpose policy engine, and essentially it allows you to separate your code from the policies and the permissions and the instructions of what users can and cannot do. Now, OPA was battle-tested by a lot of big companies, companies like Goldman Sachs, Pinterest. Um, we have companies like Netflix, which I'm going to touch on, on in a little bit. And uh, there is this diagram, I'll explain in a second, but why is OPA effective for writing permissions? Well, there is two things that OPA does great. Well, first of all, it's very efficient and very performant. So you know that all the updates to those permissions, uh, you know, they'll, they'll happen uh, quite quickly. But, and th there is actually two other uh, important points here. Uh, the first one is that whenever you do push uh, a, a policy into OPA, it actually gets stored in the cache. So whenever you're checking for that enforcement, you get that uh, reply uh, very quickly, whether someone was allowed or not allowed to do something in the system. Now, the other thing is that OPA offers support for many instances as a sidecar in your architecture. So if you have a lot of requests coming in at the same time and you need to manage them, well, you can deploy OPA several times and know that you're going to get a great latency with all those requests. But how does OPA work? So anytime you write an enforcement point within your application, the service sends a query to OPA, the OPA checks against the policy and the data, and then it returns back essentially a decision saying, yes, you are allowed to read this file. Now, what's an issue with OPA? And uh, what's a kind of a, an obstruction to any developer using it? Well, OPA uses Rego code. Anyone ever heard of Rego code? Used it? Yes, we have a few hands up. Okay, so Rego code is a, it's a declarative language. It essentially allows you to write those instructions of what certain roles can do and or they cannot do. Um, as you can see, that's an example of what OPA code might look like, Rego code, sorry. Um, it's fairly simple to read. If you read it, you can probably understand what's going on. But the problem is that who wants to write that? Not many people do, and that's, uh, that's something that maybe uh, should be looked upon to improving uh, this open source project. So why is OPA not enough? Well, imagine a case scenario where someone is logging into a system uh, and suddenly that user who had a lot of access to sensitive information gets that information revoked. But that policy is not updated because you have to manually go into OPA and change the policy. So the user who has been revoked still has access to the sensitive data. Well, that's problematic, right? And our case is, for example, if like Netflix did, uh, they have a subscription service and once you start and you become a paying customer, your role changes, you're now is paying true, uh, and uh, suddenly you should get instant access to watching your movies, watching your shows, but OPA is not a real-time um, policy engine, so, well, you, you don't. You have to have some engineer uh, go up manually and actually change that policy so that user does it. So, it's, it's well, it's, it's really not efficient at all in, in, in general. It's a standard, you should use it, but it's not efficient for running live apps. So I have Netflix here. Uh, so there's a few things that Netflix did uh, with their solution. They utilized using OPA, and they developed a solution that was extremely effective. So what did they do? Ra one, they ran multiple OPA instances simultaneously. 
So, of course, like I mentioned before, OPA allows you to do that. And because they had millions of people actually and millions of traffic coming in, well, they had to, they had to make sure that this works quite well and very, very effectively because they wanted those changes to come quite quickly. Now, the other thing, this is the really, really important part. It's how did they sync this real-time data and the policies into their infrastructure, into their architecture that are written, that every user and everyone is informed of what actually is going on in the system um, and uh, who has permissions to do what. So they did two things. They developed an aggregator as part of their architecture. That's what they called it. And the aggregator, well, that was utilizing OPA, gathered data from different sources. So, uh, for example, different Git uh, repositories or uh, you know, different uh, data, uh, data sources like a database and so on and so forth. And then they, they uh, created something called the distributor. The distributor was something that synchronized all those instances so they're all aware of the data and what's going on within them. Now, there's one other really important thing that they did, and that was kind of what made uh, everything work for everyone, is they developed a self-service feature. What does that mean? Well, they created a UI so that any engineer or someone who might not even be technical can go in, can change the policy on their own, and then it will generate Rego code for him. So that was a big win because you didn't actually waste time on engineers having to learn how to write Rego code. They could just they use the UI and it wrote the Rego code for them. So updating policies and making changes was instant. And it was really fast as well. And uh, there is one small problem with, uh, with what Netflix did, actually. And uh, it made us all feel like this. And it was because they didn't open source their solution. They kept it internally for themselves. So everyone wanting to use OPA and have a real-time driven software, well, they can't. And real-time permissions, uh, not a thing. So what happened then? Well. Opal came to the rescue. Now, Opal is actually an open source project that was written and it's currently maintained by a, uh, it was written by actually the owners of my company and now it's currently maintained by a huge community. Uh, Opal is adopted by huge companies like Tesla, Cisco, Palo Alto Networks, uh, many different banks. Uh, currently, even the NBA is using Opal, uh, which is really, really cool. And we're actually getting contributions from people who work at the NBA. Um, and why is Opal great? And uh, I'll show this diagram here and I'll explain it in a second. But Opal essentially is a layer on top of OPA. And it's an administration layer that provides those real-time updates for you to be able to know if a policy changes and when it changes. Now, uh, part of Opal, you have two uh, different uh, parts of it. You have the Opal server and you have the Opal client. Now, when data changes, when you're pushing those latest policies of Rego code into Git, Opal tracks those changes. You can actually uh, make Opal server be aware of certain topics, so it doesn't have to track the whole Git, but certain topics within the Git, and when those topics change, when the data, the policy changes, it actually sends live updates uh, via web, pub, sub, socket connection to the Opal client. Now, the Opal client is something that sits in the sidecar along with OPA. Now, what this Opal client does is it, it actually fetches all those policy and data updates, and it tells OPA in general that uh, something has changed and that the policy should now be updated. Now, along with OPA, there is this problem, and we had a lot of companies who are, for example, part of healthcare or part of, they need to have some kind of security and compliance that they need to meet to be able to use Opal. And the main question is, okay, but what about the data that we're transferring? Why is it not secure? Do, are you exposing it? Well, we're not. So what the Opal server does is it um, sends instructions of where to fetch the data, not the data itself. And then for, OPA, uh, for Opal, we have many uh, data fetchers that are also written by the community for the community to be able to then manually fetch that data from different, so different uh, sources. So we have a data fetcher for Postgres SQL, we have a data fetcher for Cosmos, and they go on and on. And we highly encourage uh, further contributions to that as well. So, I think kind of here we have to really understand what the moral of the story is. Security is very, very strict and we need to really realize that um, once we kind of get ourselves involved into building some kind of authorization solution, it needs to work well. 
Now, what we have to realize is that when we're building our apps, the, the, you know, the project of our, of our life that we really, truly love, do we really want to waste our time on making sure that uh, we create the right homebrew solution for managing access control and maintaining all our users and everything else that can go wrong around it? Well, probably not. It's, it's not really beneficial. So the kind of always tip I give myself and everyone um, that I kind of tell to, um, about Opal and OPA to and about just access management in general is that whenever there is a solution out there, and this be it, an open source solution that's free and maintained by other uh, really uh, you know, creative developers, um, of course, uh, you should use it and you should utilize it. And you should contribute. You, don't, you, sh you, sh you should never, of course, feel the pressure to contribute, but it, it, you, you know, it's a satisfaction for all of us who maintain a project that many developers make uh, awesome use of it. So that's one thing. Uh, what's the other thing? Well, open source in general is great. Like I've mentioned at the beginning, it really encourages collaboration. I mean, we're even here all today because of open source, and I think that's absolutely great. Uh, so the connections we build, you know, the impact we can have uh, on the things that we do is, is humongous. Uh, so I always highly encourage you guys to, uh, to do something in that regard and to support it. Um, and on that note, um, I'm going to end my presentation here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know I didn't introduce myself at the beginning because I wanted to jump straight into the topic, but uh, like it was mentioned, uh, my name is Philip. I'm a developer advocate at Permit.io. Uh, we run a full stack authorization solution there. I'm also a tech YouTuber, uh, and I also uh, love putting creative developers in the spotlight and uh, showing off their talent on my YouTube as well. So uh, you're very welcome to check that out too. Uh, and there is any links if you want to find me on social media. If you want to read more about Opal, if you want to join our Slack community, just chat about open source, learn the best practices of authentication and authorization, and more about Permit. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> it's the best moment. I'm pleased and honored to give you this amazing prize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Philip. Thank you very much. Amazing. <laughs> Is there any question in the room? Otherwise, I have one. Oh, yeah, there's Francesco. Yes. Th thank you for the presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, how this, uh, I mean, there is a red hot guy here, I think, over there, <laughs> so the, the, the shirt. How this solution is related, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with Keycloak, for example. Right. That is an open source uh, right. access management system. Right. So how this is related, for example, different. to Keycloak. Mm. Yes, exactly. Okay, ah. so that's why I said, so there's a really big difference between authentication providers and authorization. Authentication is, such as Keycloak, is, is a solution that identifies who you are. It proves that you really are who you, uh, you know, claim to be. Authorization is after you authenticate, after you prove you are the actual person, what permissions do you have to do? And these are two very separate things. So Keycloak or uh, Super Tokens or Clerk.dev or Off0, all of those solutions are to identify who you really are and then all the other permission systems. So the actual enforcement in your application, if someone clicks on a button, can they actually do it? That's authorization and that's part of the open source that OPA and Opal do uh, as well as we do at Permit.io. Thank you. Yeah, and remember, a question means a t-shirt. Nice. So ask questions. Oh, I wanted to ask, uh, how does uh, this solution uh, compare uh, to regards to the one that Netflix uh, built internally? I so, mean, does it yeah. generate the Rego code for you as yeah. uh, the, the one Netflix... Uh... Right, yeah, great question. So uh, actually, Opal was inspired by what Netflix did. So it doesn't necessarily generate the Rego code for you uh, because you have to still write your own Rego code. It just provides that real-time updating uh, to the software. However, now that you mentioned it, we have Permit, we actually have, a, we actually have an abstraction to that, uh, a, a no-code solution, essentially, that allows you to tick a few boxes. It's all no-code uh, with very little kind of low-code enforcement that goes onto your application, so you can manage all your permissions there, and that UI actually generates all the Rego code for you, too. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, here, my friend Lorenzo, here. Do you have already the T-shirt? Okay, so you don't need? Okay. Who has the questions? Okay, so, um, 
um, how hard was it like to get the license for open, op uh, open source project? Do you have like to pass some tests or? Um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not actually sure. I believe it perhaps was a security questionnaire or most of the time I think um, you just assign to, you sign up to a license and you pick which one when you open the project. And I think that kind of covers most of the instances. I think you have to know the ins and outs of what actually goes into a license and what you're going to be producing to know that it matches. And obviously if there are any criteria outside of that, you should probably reach out to someone who's responsible. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope that kind of answers the question, yeah. Thank you very much. Any more? I think uh, an important thing to mention now really quickly is that I brought uh, some t-shirts, a very limited amount, as much as I could stuff in my luggage. So if you, any one of you is willing to uh, come up to me, there we go, that's one, uh, come up to me and uh, I'll ask you some questions in front of my camera, um, then I'll be happy to give you a t-shirt as well. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you.